Right, for those of you who haven't noticed, there are two of us on the stage tonight. And you're probably used to seeing a single scientist here lecturing you. And in a way, Anne and I both think this hides the really fundamental collaborative nature of science. And you know, you're gonna see a band later. I think there's at least two musicians, right? Most of the time you see a band, there's more than two musicians. And you know, all of the performing arts involve lots of collaborative, creative interactions. And science is the same. And in fact, the number of creative interactions that go into a single scientific discovery is probably far greater than the number of people in the average rock and roll band. And so in that spirit, and in the spirit of collaboration that brought us both to Copenhagen at the same time, Anne and I are gonna try together to convey a bit of our, our collaborative interactions over the year and tell you a bit about what we know about stem cells. And also what your stem cells know about you. And we're gonna then try to teach you a little bit about stem cells. And we'll try to teach the stem cells how to make parts of you. But uh, we would like to start where we think you are. Uh, and uh, what you may have seen about stem cells, they've been on the news regularly. Uh, uh, sometimes it has transformed into uh, a media extravaganza. Uh, you may have seen this one. It's uh, Mark Post in the Netherlands uh, who created a stem cell hamburger, taking stem cells from the muscle of a cow, uh, growing them in a dish for three weeks uh, and generating a 142 gram hamburger. There was a, it was showcased on stage, there was a cook to make it, people to taste it. It was chewy, um, not very tasty because it didn't have fat. Was it worth the money? <laughs> and sometimes um, it has transformed into uh, the snake all of the day. Uh, it has given ideas to companies to create products uh, that they can make a lot of money off. Uh, and you may have seen some stem cell products on the shelves, uh, like this one. Oh, that, that's inspiring. You, you want to have it. Uh, you want to put youth on you, right? They have maybe used stem cells. Uh, stem cells are certainly not alive in this cream. Again, you judge whether it's worth the money. Yeah. And it has tended to be yeah, really the snake oil of the day. Yeah. You must have heard of uh, uh, therapies. Stem cells are supposed to cure everything. And we'll come back, we'll return to that. But we thought in the first place to judge on your own. You, know a little bit, you need to know a little bit about when stem cells are. So stem cells are defined really not by what they are. In fact, I would say we probably don't really know what they are. We know what they can do. And that's really the essential definition of a stem cell. They can make other cells. So, you know, you've got lots of cells in your body. This is an example of three different types of cell. And these cells actually were made from stem cells. Um, you have these beautiful heart-like cells beating in a dish. You have neurons, like the neurons in your brain. You have hair, you have eyes, you have ears, nose, toenails. All of these structures in your body have different cells. And the way we then define a stem cell is a stem cell that, as I said, is able as a cell that can make other cells. That's one of the things it can do. And the other thing it can do is make itself. And we call this process renewal or self-renewal, that it can make itself, and this is its potency. So there are essentially two types of stem cells in very broad terms, and this is what we're gonna to talk to you about this evening. There are pluripotent stem cells, which are most clearly defined based on stem cells from a very early embryo, we call them embryonic stem cells, and then there are tissue stem cells, which we'll come to in a little while. But these are stem cells that have more restricted potency and have roles in maintaining your organs, um, all the structures in your body later on, your blood. So let's go back to all these cells we have. As I said, you have this diversity of cells, a fantastic 
the diverse number of cells. Where do they all come from? When are they all made? Well, they're all made during a process that we all go through, and that's called development. Development is the process of going from a single fertilized egg, where we all start, to a complex embryo with lots of structures. We have eyes, a nose, you have a brain here, you have limbs, you have blood, and all these diverse cell types already. But you start with this one cell, and then you go from one cell to make two cells, and then four, and then eight. And then at a certain point, somebody's got to decide, I'm going to be the outside, I'm going to be the inside, or more importantly, I'm going to be the head, and I'm going to be the tail. Right? So how do these guys in this otherwise identical sphere of indistinguishable cells, how does one guy decide, I'm going to be the head? It has to do with accessing information. And it has to do with a concept that we developmental stem cell biologists refer to as state space. So state space is actually much more complicated than any sort of theoretical space that the physicists talk about, because its dimensionality is determined by the number of genes you have in your genome. So we're talking about 20,000 dimensions at least. Anyway, state space is the particular set of information that a cell has. And the movement of a cell through that informational domain is, can be depicted as a ball rolling down a hill. And in this case, you start up at the top here, and you can go down in any direction you want. And that ball can then go down in one direction to become hair, and another direction to become muscle. And this, this diagram here, it was d d drawn by Conrad Waddington in 1957 in his Strategy of Genes. And this was actually, really interestingly, around the same time as Watson and Crick were first talking about the structure of DNA. So he's already thinking about genes as the source of this information in state space. And the way you can think about it is your genome is like this library. And within this library, there are books on how to be a muscle and how to be a bit of hair. And the real trick is for those cells to decide which books to take out. And as those cells progress down the hill, they take out different books which give them instructions on how to become a particular type of cell. And the stem cell is a cell that, particularly a pluripotent stem cell, is a cell that can become everything. It has access to the full library. And this is kind of reminiscent of the first time the term stem cells was used, and that was by the um, evolutionary biologist Heckel, who was a bit of a philosopher, and he termed this idea of a stem cell as the new cell from which the child develops and which is genetically loosely called the fertilized ovum or the first segmental sphere. I call it the stem cell. So this was over 100 years ago that the notion of stem cells were first defined. And it's pretty close to what we're talking about, the cell that can become anything. But Anne is going to now tell us a little bit about what a real pluripotent cell is. Well, Hegel wasn't very far from when stem cells are nowadays. Uh, uh, what he referred to as the fertilized oven was this one cell that's going to build us. Uh, and what we derived stem cells from is actually this three and a half uh, day embryo. Uh, there are a few more cells, uh, and all of them have the capacity to become a stem cell. The cells here are shown uh, magnified here, so there's a bit of diversity shown by different colors. Uh, and if you take this embryo, you put it in culture, the cells are going to migrate out, uh, and they will invade the culture dish, uh, if you put the right medium, and they will divide. And they will divide to generate daughters, granddaughters, grand-granddaughters, uh, until it fills the plate. And when it's full, you can plant it in a new plate, and does that forever. So the stem cells then remain in this state, uh, but they can also uh, specialize and differentiate and generate all the cells of the body. Uh, so ES cells, uh, like the mother embryonic cell, can give rise to the sperm. Very interesting, because in that way, they're going to go even to the next generation and the one after, or to all sides for females. The skin, the brain, the digestive uh, tract, muscle, every cell. 
And this capacity to give rise to tons of things, that's called pluripotency. And how do we know that a cell is actually pluripotent? So part of what my group works on is understanding how cells can be pluripotent. And how do we test that? Well, because I told you we don't know what a stem cell is, and you'll actually get a better idea for that in a few minutes. We know what it can do. And so we say a pluripotent cell is a cell that can make any cells. So we either differentiate it in a dish, as I showed you earlier, to make all different cell types. We can differentiate it in vivo in a tumor. So we can put these cells into the back of this little guy here, and we get a tumor. And that tumor is really remarkable, and I'll show you a picture of it. It has everything in it, but just a bit disorganized. The other thing we can do is we can put them back into embryos. And here's an illustration of blastocyst injection. And that's the, the third way of demonstrating it. So I showed you differentiation. I'll just quickly show you the example of this tumor I promised you. Here it is. You have an eyeball. You have some hair. You have, a bit of, you have two teeth here. You have some fat. You've got every bit. I mean, it's kind of like taking your face and randomizing it and putting it inside of a tumor. It's amazing, right? <laughs> It's actually, you know, you, you laugh, but it was scientists staring at this tumor, these tumors that gave them the idea that stem cells might exist. Right. So as I said, the other thing you can do is put them back into embryos. And I think this is a particularly beautiful illustration of this. This is typical blastocyst injection. This is a blastocyst stage embryo. So this is after a little bit of specialization. And you can inject emb embryonic stem cells into this, but you can also, as our lab recently did, inject them into the two cell stage. And what I think is really nice about this image is you can see the ES cells, this tiny red cell. And it's sitting next to these two big embryo cells. And this is now the blastocyst a few days later, and you can see the pink cells are that ES cell. And it's taken over the embryo. And actually, if you wait for these guys to be born, the ES cell encodes for a gene that, that it, makes these fur, the fur brown, and that the blastocyst was black. And this brown mouse here and a few of its litter mates are all derived from one single stem cell. This is another really nice traditional example of what we call a chimera for a stem cell and embryo mixture. The stem cell was labeled with a dye that would turn blue, and so you can see where all the stem cells are throughout that embryo. And so in this way, we can know that these stem cells can really make anything. So where does this property of that stem cell come from? Is there a place in evolution that it comes from? Well, I think that it comes from a property that we mammals do really, really well, and that is twinning, right? A lot of you possibly have twins out there, and those twins can be created in a number of ways, but one of the things that's really remarkable about the mammalian embryo is twinning events can happen quite late. So look at this embryo. It's got diversity. As Anne said, there's many different cell types already here. And they're all different colors. Therefore, they're, we say that they're reading different books. right? And um, if you rip away some of these cells, actually it, the, the cells regenerate. And this is why we can do pregestational diagnosis. Also, you can take one of those cells and you can try and ask if one of these cells from this embryo will actually generate a mouse. And actually, a very famous Polish embryologist named Tarkovsky took one cell from a 32 cell stage embryo and showed it could make an animal. And I actually like to say that this sort of gives, I think, a new dimension to the right to life movement because they talk about life, a potential life being born at conception. And I think that if you're gonna take that argument one step further, you'd say that every time you let a baby be born, you're sacrificing 31 other potential lives. <laughs> right, so, the other thing, as I say, you can do is you can, and you can do all sorts of crazy things to these embryos. So you can stick two of them together. And what happens when you stick two of them together? Well, they form one embryo, and the cells in that embryo, these cells that were different, they just change and they readjust. So you get one normal, 
bigger embryo, which then goes on to give an animal that's a mixture of the two. And you can see a really nice example that I like to show students here of a black and a brown mouse. Again, you can see the polka dotted fur. And that is an example of a genetic chimera. And because we twin easily, it's actually been documented, there are probably some of you in this room, that if you were to go and you were to try to do a genetic test tomorrow, you might get really confusing results. Because if you are the result of some sort of fusion event like this, between two twins, you would have two different genomes within the same body. Right. So the last thing I want to tell you about pluripotency to try to really illustrate this idea of this theoretical concept of stem cells is look at this blastocyst, this embryo. You can see all the differences already appearing. Each of these cells is a different color because it's reading a different book from the library. And this is actually what happens when you look at the books being read by embryonic stem cells. You can see now this is not a single cell type but rather a collection of cell types, just like that embryo, except maybe a bit more disorganized. And so a way of thinking about this is that in stem cell culture, what we've done is fenced in a number of different intermediates. And I like to use an intermediate, I'm sorry, I like to use an example to describe this, that now, in the introduction, you might have guessed that I lived in Scotland for a long time. <laughs> and what you can see over to my right is a sheep. <laughs> right? It took me a long time to recognize this animal because I grew up in New York City. And these are the sort of sheep I was used to looking at. <laughs> and so when I first saw these sheep, I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. And as you can just see, my sheep is able to move across the stage, right? So these sheep, the stem cell sheep, are able to move across a pasture. And that pasture, if you think about a hill now, the sheep can go down the hill or exit the pasture in many different directions. The direction that the sheep exits the pasture is a direction to make a different type of cell. So if it's on this side, it goes down and it makes a muscle. If it's on this side, it goes down and it makes a gut. What is remarkable about stem cells is they exist within a pasture where they can choose multiple exits and they can move between these exits back and forth. And the fence keeps them in. And if you, if you release the fence, unfortunately we only have one sheep on stage, <laughs> If you, if you remove the fence at any one time, the sheep can exit at random. And this is the problem with stem cells. But if you have a sheep dog and you push them all to one side and you open that one gate, perhaps they will all go out the same way. And we have this video in which you have another energy-esque landscape where you will see the sheep reproducing at the top. And eventually the pasture gets pretty crowded and they get over the edge and they start down. But you can see they have a choice between different paths down the mountain. And as they go down the mountain, they adopt different identities. They're moving through state space, ask, accessing different sections of the library, so to speak, reading different books until they reach a point where they actually distinguish themselves functionally. And the ability of stem cells at the top to move back and forth between these different lineages means that we don't necessarily know what they look like at any moment because they could be over here, they could be over here and look somewhat different. But because they can move back and forth, they're a stem cell. And when you get to this bottom point here, actually it doesn't end. You can have a pasture halfway down the mountain where perhaps you have enough grass so that the sheep are happy. You have a boy and a girl, they reproduce. And yet there's a river there that they can't cross over. But, you know, when you run out of blood, you build a bridge, and now you tell the sheep to go off in the direction to make more blood cells. And Anne is about to tell you all about that. So what you've heard about so far... Where, where, there we go. Okay. Uh, are pluripotent stem cells, and specifically embryonic stem cells. You could say Josh works on them, he loves them, he can talk about them for hours. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, once the ear cells, embryonic stem cells, have finished, uh, or the, uh, they behave like the early embryo and they build the whole body, 
But even when we are adults, even when we age, we retain stem cells in many of our organs, not all of them. And what do these stem cells do? Well, well they, replenish, they re, uh, re, renew the organs. Uh, so for instance, your skin uh, is shed every month. Every new month, the entire cells of your skin are going to be new. The other ones are dead, they form house dust. In the intestine, it's even fa faster. In four days, your intestine is renewed. It's because stem cells have divided, multiplied, and generated many of the other specialized cells. I mean, the intestine has a lot of insults with acid, and uh, it needs to uh, renew very often. So it's the case for an intestine, the skin. Uh, it's also the case for the cornea of the eye. Uh, you may have heard of the bone marrow. Uh, the bone marrow uh, is inside the bones, uh, and that's where the stem cells that will give rise to the blood are located. Uh, that's where they proliferate, then they get out and they generate the blood. Not all organs have stem cells. Uh, there are many areas in the brain which don't renew, uh, and there are no stem cells. There are a few areas in the brain that have stem cells, especially for learning and memory. Yeah. So we call these stem cells multipotent, uh, because they don't have all the capacities to give rise to all cell types. The stem cells located in the intestine only give rise to cells of the intestine. They're not going to start making a neuron, luckily. Yeah. Um, and these stem cells, these adult stem cells, are the ones that went to the clinic first. So the story starts uh, about in the 50s. Uh, it's just after the war. People have discovered that uh, uh, transplantation would be very useful for people who got burns, uh, and also they've discovered leukemia uh, uh, after ir irradiation. Um, so they wanted to, do, to replenish these organs uh, and replace them um, to save people. So the stem cells of the bone marrow here uh, um, are uh, the stem cells that give rise to the blood. They give rise to the blood, right blood cells, the red blood cells, and uh, all of the cells of the blood. So. It's possible to take them out uh, and uh, graft them in patients. And that's currently used. The first time it was do it, done, it was in the, uh, in the 50s uh, by Donald Thomas in the US, uh, transplanting between two twins. Uh, one had the leukemia, and the, and the, the brother uh, um, saved him. Um, then in, in France, uh, uh, by Dr. Maté, uh, uh, George Maté, uh, who uh, used people from, uh, who were not siblings. Uh, and it went to the clinic uh, on a regular basis in the 70s. Uh, it worked well enough, we understood enough of, of the um, immunity. Uh, so what, what can happen if someone has a uh, leukemia, uh, you can uh, put high doses of radiations uh, or chemicals uh, to kill the le leukemia cells, uh, but it also kills the stem cells of the blood. So you can take the stem cells from the blood, bone marrow from a donor patient who's uh, immunologically compatible and graft them. Uh, so you inject them, you purify them, you inject them in the blood, and these cells will find their niche. They will migrate in the blood and they will find their way to the bone marrow where they like to live. And when they're there, they can multiply and will give rise to the blood of the patient for the entire life. So there's all, there are other uses of uh, uh, stem cells, uh, uh, adult stem cells currently, uh, uh, which are a little newer. Uh, uh, for instance, um, when there are heavy skin burns, uh, usually uh, if the burn is too important, you need to graft some cells. So you can usually take some cells in a hidden part of the body, uh, take a little bit of skin and graft it, and it will expand locally. But if uh, it's a very severe burn and a lot of the, pay, the, the body has been burned, then you can't do that because there's not enough skin left to transplant everywhere. So what you can do is that you can take a piece of skin, but instead of putting it in the patient, uh, you put it in the culture petri dish, and the stem cells are there, and they will expand. They will fill the petri dish, uh, and you can split it into two petri dishes and do that for three, four weeks. And in that time, you get enough cells to transplant even a whole body. Yeah. You can recuperate these cells, uh, lift them up gently from the bottom of the dish, and put them on top of the burn. Uh, they're not perfect, uh, not as good as the bone marrow transplant, uh, 
The skin is very fragile, and also um, they don't generate sweat glands and hair. And if they could, uh, we could graft Josh. We could graft some of you, and we could probably make a lot of money. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's not close to the clinic. We can't do that yet. We don't know how to generate everything even though we know that there are stem cells in the hair. We just don't know how to culture them. What we've uh, been able to do recently, not us, but in Europe, uh, scientists in Italy have found a way uh, to do corneal grafts. Uh, uh, so that's the part in front of your eye. And uh, the stem cells reside in the periphery, in the limbus. Uh, and you can, if there's a burn in one eye, you can take the stem cells from the other eye put it in culture, make it grow, and then graft it in the new eye. So that's beginning, that's done a lot in uh, India, uh, and uh, now it can be done in Europe. You may be concerned about many other types of diseases, no patients, uh, or just care about it. Uh, uh, we don't have therapies yet for these other diseases, uh, but there's a lot of clinical trials um, for um, to test whether therapies would work for neurodegenerative diseases such as amyotrophic lateral dystrophy, motor neuron disease, stroke, spinal cord injury, or non neural osteoarthritis. So, any part of the body when cells are destroyed, you can think of making therapies, and there are hundreds of clinical trials at the moment. Um, a trial can work, a trial often fails, so you first test the safety and then efficacy. And for instance, there are some failures recently. Mesenchymal stem cells have been thought to be able to cure, uh, to do heart repair, but the benefit uh, was either minor or there was no benefit at all. Same thing for trials in spinal cord injury. So only very few current applications. Now, I told you that many organs don't have stem cells, so should we give up? We can't repair them then. Well, we are, always have plans. Yes, so <laughs> as I told you, we have pluripotent stem cells. But pluripotent stem cells know too much. They're kind of schizophrenic. And if you take a ball of pluripotent stem cells and you put them into a dish, they start trying to make an embryo, but they make an embryo in a really chaotic way. So you can see here that you have an example of a bunch of pluripotent stem cells. They have a bit of sort of gut-like cell on the outside and then some neurons, beautiful neurons on the inside. But, you know, this is not an embryo. And so we face this problem with the cells. They, they're, they're, they're pretty stubborn. They do what they want. You know, you remove that you remove the fence around the sheep in the pasture and there's no predicting which way they're going to go out and they're not going to do the same thing twice. And so this is in essence the problem we have. How do we get this guy who's so confused to follow a single trajectory down the mountain, right? How do we get this ES cell to go progressively through a series of decisions to make a cell, and in this case, we've illustrated a cell, which is a hormonal cell, which would be used to treat diabetes. To get there, you have to go through all of these steps in which each step has a different set of instructions, a different book from the library. You can look at it this way. We have a big, big genome. And at each step, you have to pick out the gene that you're going to read you have to pick out that book that you want for every single step in this process. And so while this may seem relatively obvious, all about 20 to 25 years of research has been invested in trying to get stem cells to get to this place. And despite all of that work, and despite all the improvements in technology, today, we are not really there yet. All of these years, and we still don't have a cell that is perfectly functional, that's really like a hormonal cell from your pancreas. So, but, you know, perhaps 
I'm a bit too pessimistic. What do you think? Anne? Yeah, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, there are some cells we don't know how to make, but there are cells we know how to make. And that's very fresh news. It was published last week. We've been waiting for it for many years. Uh, and that's uh, the first application of uh, the first success uh, uh, in clinical trials with uh, embryonic stem cell, uh, with um, pluripotent stem cell derived organs. Uh, so the disease uh, it's applied to is macular degeneration. It's a blindness disease. Uh, uh, it's a disease of, in general, the old age, but not always, uh, where instead of uh, seeing well like this, uh, you have a blind spot in the middle, and this spot tends to expand with time. Um, this is due to a uh, degeneration in the retina. Uh, and actually, the cells that degenerate, if you make a section of the eye, or this black layer here, the retinal pigmented cells. So they here um, degenerate. Uh, and because they degenerate and they use to feed the retina and the photoreceptors, uh, the photoreceptors die. And then you lose vision from one spot and then it spreads. Last week, there was the first report of a team of scientists uh, uh, in uh, Japan who've published uh, that they've transplanted, they've managed to uh, convert the, cell, the stem cells into retinal pigmented cells and to grow them in a dish uh, in conditions that can be transplanted to patients. Uh, they can form layers and they just insert it in the back of the eye. Uh, the surgery is not very difficult. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the patients that they have transplanted have stabilized their vision. So you, what you expect with this disease is that the vision goes down and here it stabilizes. It's not getting better because some of the photoreceptors have been damaged, so the next step would be to graft at the same time new photoreceptors and the cells that sustain their life. So that's the bright side, it gives us a lot of hope. In the same journal, which is called New England Journal of Medicine, it may sound like a very local journal, it's actually the, one of the best journals in medicine, the one that's the most famous. Uh, uh, so that's the paper I was talking about, uh, but uh, at the same time, there was another paper, back to back, uh, uh, which is the dark side of stem cells. Uh, um, that's actually the story of a money-making business uh, uh, based on the hopes uh, and despair of families and of patients who have diseases and they don't know what to do to cure them. So uh, that's uh, clinics, uh, which very often do trials which are not approved by uh, their federal agencies here in the US. Um, uh, so in that case, they've transplanted in patients with the same disease, uh, uh, in three patients, stem cells derived from the fat, because the fat is easy to get, we all have some. Um, and they put the fat in the eye. From my perspective, uh, it's quite a weird idea because fat cells are so much miles away from eye cells. Uh, how should they cure an eye disease? Uh, um, no, so the patients no. paid $5,000 uh, uh, for something that was not approved. Uh, and then there, were, there was no follow-up. Uh, and the patients went to uh, other clinics. And that's the people who report this. Uh, and they followed the patients, and all of them had lost uh, partially or completely their vision. So that's a warning story. Uh, uh, be very careful if you are considering stem cell therapies. Uh, uh, there are very good uh, guidebooks on the um, st um, Stem Cell Society website on how to choose and what to pay attention to. Um, there are other clinical trials beyond this one. Um, there's another one going on in diabetes. Uh, and there will be some uh, going on very soon in Parkinson's diseases. But it's not so many based on pluripotent stem cells. What I didn't tell you is that the macular degeneration, the disease I told you about, uh, didn't start from embryonic stem cells. I told you they were pluripotent stem cells, but they actually induced pluripotent stem cells. And that's a new development in the field. Uh, but maybe I will let Josh explain to you uh, what iPS cells. It's back to pluripotency. That's his turf. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add something to what Anne said, because, you know, it's something that we talked about in preparing this, and we sort of cut out. But when she mentioned the fat cells, I thought of it. 
So you know what the number one country in the world is for liposuction? It's Brazil. Now, they have a huge amount of plastic surgery there. And as a result, they actually offer quite, and it's got a big private health insurance industry business. And they offer quite a lot of potential trials with fat-derived stem cells for any patient who wants to travel to Brazil you know, to get surgery. And there are a lot of countries where this is going on. And I think it's a very important thing to know that you know, in less controlled places where there may be the potential to do um, uh, stem cell transplantation studies, and actually I don't want to single out Brazil as being irresponsible, but I mean it is an example where they have a lot of mesenchymal stem cell trials going on, that it's really important that you're careful if you're thinking, ah, there must be a miracle cure somewhere, that you go and you think about that before you go and travel abroad to do it. Um, I think that, that now I tell you a bit about uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And um, induced pluripotent stem cells is the concept that you can revert a cell to pluripotency. So the idea is you can take a cell and you can re-expose it to the books from the library that tell it how to be at the top of the library. Some of you may be old enough, although I don't think many, to remember that libraries used to have card catalogs, which told you where you could find books before computers. And one way of thinking about this is that you give these cells back the card catalog to tell them how they can find everything in the library so you can start them again. And this experiment, which was actually only done about 10 years ago now by Shinya Yamanaka, who was the smartest scientist to do the experiment that most of the stem cell community were too smart to try. It was the, what they all thought the stupid experiment that would never work. But Shinya, you know, just did that simple of experiment of figuring out what were the books that were being used in ES cells and then introducing them into a skin cell and asking what would happen. And sure enough, that skin cell was transformed back into a stem cell to make an induced pluripotent cell. So that did result in Shinya, together with John Gurdon, receiving the Nobel Prize um, a few years ago for this idea of reprogramming, of taking stem cell, of taking mature cells, somatic cells, and taking them back up the hill to the point where they can make anything again. If two cells are actually quite similar, they may actually have very similar sets of instructions. And so giving them a little bit extra detail, a little extra reading material, is not going to be a problem. But doing this, taking that cell from that one gene and re-exposing it to everything, is not so easy. But with a few factors, you can do it. So you can take those sheep or those cells, and you can push them back up the hell, hill to where they can make anything again. And as you can see, if you're trying to take a skin cell, which in terms of lineage is similar to a nerve, it's an easier process. So what is the amazing thing about this achievement? Well, it suggests that any of you in this audience could go and give up some skin and make your own stem cells. And that would be fantastic, because what is the biggest problem with kidney transplantation? Well, it's rejection, right? You get a kidney and your immune system knows it's not you, and so you reject it. Or you live with immune suppression for the rest of your life. But imagine you could make a kidney from your own stem cells. It would solve a lot of problems. But think about the cost of that hamburger. $300,000 just to make a hamburger. How much do you think it's gonna to cost to make a kidney? And this is a really, really serious problem when you think about trying to make stem cells from everyone in this room or everyone in Europe. And so, while sometime in the distant future we may find ways to do this very cheaply, there's a real social conversation that goes, needs to go on, which is how much of this sort of personalized regenerative medicine can we, can we sustain in a fair way as a society? And how much is it that we can, um, and how much is it that we really can't justify without just having a few rich people who make their own stem cells? And 
Um, so we may get there. And actually, Shinya Yamanaka has this fantastic project in Japan where he's trying to make certain immunotypic iPS cell lines so that he can service the most number of transplant patients. But, you know, one of the things about these pluripotent cells, these iPS cells, is we want to try and, as I say, make kidneys and organs. And Ant's going to tell you a little bit about that in a second. What I just want to finish the bit on pluripotency on is this notion that, as I said, these cells can self-organize, whether they're iPS cells or embryonic stem cells. They can make these structures in a dish, and they look sort of like an embryo, but not quite. And actually, they look considerably different. So here's an early embryo, and you can see the, the beautiful structure here, the different cell types being formed. And there's that, what we call, that, that blob we call an embryo body. But now, if you pay, play with the gunk in which you grow the cells, the stuff that you suspend them, you can start to get something that looks more like this. All right? That looks kind of a lot like an embryo, doesn't it? In this case, you've added some placental stem cells to some embryonic stem cells. But now we're facing actually a really big ethical question, right? which is, at what point do you say whether or not this is a human being? And I guess you also have the same question, as Anne will show you in a second, about when you create an organoid that starts to look like a brain, at what point does it start to think? Anne, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so to make organs, we, you need to make the cells and you need to organize them properly. Uh, and uh, that's something that started uh, in about 2009 uh, in the lab of Hans Clevers in the Netherlands, uh, starting with uh, the stem cells that are located in our intestine, in what we call the crypts, uh, these green cells here, which uh, multiply and then migrate up and replace progressively uh, all the cells that, uh, the digestive cells, uh, that form a large surface, which we call villi. He's found a way to take out these stem cells of the intestine, put them in culture in gels, when spontaneously yeah, they can remain themselves, but one of the daughters will specialize, differentiate, make other cell types. And these cells find a way to organize. The gel is very soft. Uh, it leaves a lot of space for the cells. Uh, um, to make mechanical changes in shapes. Um, and they form this structure where you have the stem cells here in the little crypts at the periphery, and you have the digestive cells lining a ball. It's not yet a tube, uh, but it looks very much like an intestine. We've been able to do that uh, with uh, stem cells from the early mouse embryos. If we take out the pancreas and we uh, get the, the stem cells, uh, we seed them in similar gels. Uh, they will form this time not gut cells, but pancreatic cells. They are different cell types. They also take a different shape, so they form a lot of branches uh, uh, like the pancreas. That's fascinating. That's self-organization. How a cell you put in vitro uh, will generate daughters and will find a way to organize like they would do in the body without any other information. And to make sure that you uh, bear in mind and understand this concept of self-organization, we uh, took out this, this movie, uh, which I think illustrates very well and is going back to the ships. This time, it's in Wales. <laughs> and uh, the shepherds uh, uh, are the scientists. Uh, they are trying to guide the sheep. These ones are really good. Uh, I haven't met a lot of shepherds who can do that. Uh, the sheep uh, are like the cells, they are different, they are different colors, they are white cells and black cells, uh, white and black sheep. The dogs are what we put in a culture medium, it helps uh, get the cells where we want. Uh, but most of it is done by a sheep. They self-organize, and they self-organize in a very dynamic way. And that's the same for our cells, they change with time. Now it's getting close to science fiction and close to the end uh, of our talk. Uh, now, can we dream that we'll go to the hospital because one of our organs has failed and we'll get a transplant, your medical doctor will go on the shelf, will take a jar with the right organ, 
put it back. Um, we can make a lot of organs. I uh, told you about the pancreas, about the gut, the stomach, the eyeballs, uh, uh, the kidney, and there's even a brain organoid. Uh, this thing that you wonder whether it thinks. Um, uh, but we are not very close to transplantation. So we can make these different uh, organoids uh, or organ-like miniature organs uh, from embryonic progenitors, ES or iPS cells, adult stem cells. Um, are we ready for transplantation? Not quite. Uh, no. First of all, they're very small. Uh, they're less than five millimeters. Uh, that's going to be way too small for you. Uh, uh, second, they don't have blood vessels, and they're missing sometimes a few cells. So they're not perfect organs yet. But we think they're very useful and they will get more and more useful. The first very nice models of uh, organ development uh, in human, because we develop in the womb. So it's very difficult to know what, to figure out what's going on. And we think we understand what's going on by looking at how mice do it. But there are differences between us and mice. Uh, uh, so we want to figure out, uh, and now we can use, look at organs developing in a dish, human organs. Uh, we can also introduce mutations in these cells uh, to create genetic models of diseases. Uh, so we can make uh, uh, diseased organs uh, in a dish. And on these diseased organs, uh, we can start screening drugs to figure out what are the drugs that are fixing this or this problem. This is complementary to what is done in animals. Uh, uh, we can also do uh, uh, toxo toxicology assays. If you have found a drug that's fixing the problem, you want to know whether it's toxic to other organs. Uh, and you can test this on the many organs. Uh. So we think it's going to be very, very useful in the future years. Uh, and it has already started. Uh, this story started about uh, five, six years ago. Uh, uh, now, in the beginning of this year, uh, there's a deal that has been made between scientists, uh, medical doctors, and health insurance companies uh, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, where they will try to find whether organoids can be used to find the best medications for patients. And in that case, uh, that's for a disease called cystic fibrosis. It's a genetic disease uh, where a channel that carries uh, chloride ions uh, is mutated. But depending on patients, they have different mutations. And there are drugs on the market but they don't work on all patients. And these drugs are very, very expensive. So if you test them in a patient, that's going to cost you a lot. So the deal is that they're going to take biopsies from the colon of these patients, uh, which is a minor medical act. Uh, you take the biopsy, you form an organoid. And uh, in a normal pe person, they have an assay by which this organoid will swell. Uh, if, uh, um, yeah. But in a patient, uh, these organoids, because they don't have the channel, the right channel, they don't swell anymore. Now you can try the different drugs you have uh, and try to see the one that works the best. That's matching exactly your patient. So. so in the long term, we may not have to test every single patient and we may be able to save money because we'll be able to make groups of patients and predict and keep the information which type of patient responds to which drug. And that's also a concept that's being developed using organoids in the cancer field uh, in a very similar way, uh, even though no deal has been made anywhere with insurance companies yet in that case. So that's not yet reality. Uh, so we're going to end here and take any question if you have some. We've, we hope we've responded to a few of uh, the queries you may have had. Um, but we still have a lot more questions. How do these cells, when they self-organize, in the absence of any external information, how do they do it? And we need to understand it enough to be able to control the cells. And that's yet not done. Um, there's also a tremendous clinical potential, but how far can we go towards developing personalized medicine? There are societal issues, there are technical issues, uh, uh, there's a financial cost. Finally, uh, Ethically, what are these stem cell creations we make in a dish when we have a mini brain, a brain organoid? Is it human? Does it start thinking? How would we measure that? Uh, so we will let you uh, dream with that. I would like to uh, thank uh, 
all the people who have worked with us over the years, uh, who've made a fantastic environment where we've learned a lot more, uh, both in our labs, at the Danish Stem Cell Center, uh, Danstem, in the University of Copenhagen. And we've also presented quite a lot of work that was not just our own this evening, but that comes from other groups within the community. It's a fantastically interactive scientific community and is very collaborative. Um, and as I said earlier, nobody makes a single discovery on their own really these days. And also our funders who have been very generous to support both Anne and my work over the last many years, um, both private sources such as foundations here in Denmark, the Nova Nordisk Foundation, Lundbeck, and the government here, as well as past funding. And I wanted to end on a note that, that, Anne, that, has been, that Anne and I have been discussing, and it's, been quite, it's quite a debate within science, is that there's been a large push on the part of politicians to try and make science more translational, to deliver a product to you in the clinic. And the problem with that is, is you don't really know where those innovations are going to come from. And if your government or your foundation is single-minded about driving for a product, you lose track of where, of where the real innovation that you can exploit may come from. And the example of that that I think we should end on is that those tumors that we discussed in the beginning, they were originally characterized in a very strange inbred strain of mice called 129. And these 129 mice had these really weird tumors with eyes and teeth and eyeballs. And a bunch of developmental biologists thought this idiosyncrasy in animals was really kind of interesting. And they noticed that the, some of the cells in the center of those tumors looked a bit like early embryonic cells. And that was the birth of the stem cell era, at least the embryonic pluripotent stem cell era. It is, was the birth of the revolution in which you know all of this I, these ideas have directed towards regeneration. And it was all because of sort of a serendipitous discovery in a strange strain of mice. And so I think we should leave it with that because you don't know where the next amazing innovation is going to come from. And thank everyone for being here tonight and listening to us. And we hope that we've kept you interested and inspired your interest in stem cell biology. Thank you very much. <laughs>